This is OFN NFL preview on the Lads Football Network as we talk AFC South football with Mark Lawrence of Playbook.com. Mark, how's it going this week? A little warm and toasty down here in South Florida, but that's to be expected this time of the year, Greg. How's everything going with you? You must have those air conditioners just really pumped up big to be wearing a jacket like that in South Florida in August. It's got to be, what, a good, I don't know, you tell me, is it uh, 70 in, in your office? Well, my office is probably, you know, 74. Uh, outside, it's another matter. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. I remember those days. Thank goodness yeah. I remember them. This way I'll never forget. <laughs> In case I'm ever thinking of moving down there again. Too hot for me, brother. All right. So, AFC South football. How surprised are you, if any, that the Indianapolis Colts are the favorite to win the division? Well, it's likely that because there's nobody that really steps to the forefront inside this division. It's either as balanced as a division can be or as mediocre as a division can be. Take your choice. And for that reason, we find Indianapolis coming the favorite here. And largely, uh, if for no other reason, because of a new quarterback. Yeah, the Rivers, this is a great opportunity for him. This is his last opportunity to try to win a Super Bowl. So. Uh, he's got the coach. He's, there's some good players there. He's 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 definitely one of the top quarterbacks uh, still in the league. Hopefully, if you're a Colt fan, he still has it. Uh, the Colts are the favorite. They're even money to win the division. They're 12 to one for the championship, 20 to one for the Super Bowl. Then you have Tennessee, two to one, 15 to one, and 28 to one. Houston's three to one, 20 to one, and a whopping 66 to one. Interesting how their numbers just really skyrocket once you get to the Super Bowl. And uh, Jacksonville uh, expected to have a real snoozer of a year, 2,100 and 200. Before we get started, to remember, remind everybody right here, the playbook.com magazine. And don't blame Mark on the failures of the Big Ten and the Pac-12. Uh, or the Mountain West. Or the, or the Mac. Uh, I just hope the SEC... And the ACC stand uh, stand firm, but there's still all sorts of NFL and still a lot of uh, important college football uh, data in here, depending on what kind of college football season we have, Mark. And uh, yeah, it's, it's been a bad week for college football fans everywhere, uh, we're, but we're still ho holding out hope that the SEC and the ACC will will stand firm. Well, on a sidebar note, Greg, you can also throw the Big 12 in there because they right. ex expressed a desire to play. So they will yes. then become the power three, yes, if you will. And uh, with that, we may see some college football this fall. But I think what it ends up being is a very, very fortuitous situation for the National Football League, who can now schedule games Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday and completely dominate the ratings in doing so. And I'd be interested to see if Nebraska, or Iowa, tries to find a way into the Big 12 or something like that, you know, for one season, yeah. or the independents. Yeah, that would be secession from the, from the Big 10 conference. And if uh, they were to try to do something like that, they could wave goodbye to the Big 10 conference. Uh, you know, they're not going to stand by the conference and do something outside of the conference's wishes. This, yet that will have been their last day inside the Big 10. Uh, I don't think it's going to end up happening. I think it's a lot of talk and a lot of angry words, if you will. I, mean, I know there's people that wanted to play, and you know, my belief is that uh, I honestly feel that the college football players would have been in a safer environment playing football yeah. than are the students that are attending classes at those universities mm -hmm. because the players are under protocol. They're under constant watch. They're being tested, unlike the players who are I mean, the students who are not. So now you tell these players to go to class, forget about football, and they're more likely or, or susceptible <laughs> to, to being coming out positive. I know. I know. Yeah. It doesn't make any sense. I mean, yeah. I can understand if the schools, even though that statistically doesn't make any sense, why the schools would say we're not going to open them up, but the schools are open. So if the schools are open, then why in the world can't they play football? It doesn't. It, it's just. It's. It's. It, it, you know, I never thought that I would hate politics more in my life than 
and when the 2020 year began and and I've got this sickness in my stomach re- regarding politics like you would never believe so much so that it's 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 for the first time in my life I'm embarrassed and I'm disgusted with my country for for all politicians on both sides it's sickening it's disgusting that the people that have lost their jobs over this that 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 depend on a living for college football they don't care they don't and it's it's it, I'm I'm just so sick of it yeah it's really disgusting i mean everybody's really feeling anger right now over the whole situation the pandemic situation uh but to you know to throw kerosene on the fire right now when you could have at least dampened the fire yes with a little you know, with a little bit of effort here by groups and factions of people that actually want to play the game, mm-hmm. it's disgusting. It's disgusting. I think I'm moving to Sweden. That's what I'm thinking about. Yeah. I like their approach, man. Their approach was, hey, we're not going anywhere. We're not, we're not, no one's going indoors. We're just going to allow this thing to sweep through. It's swept through. It's swept out. And now they're back to normal. Why, why couldn't we have done that? Of course not. Well, go to New, go to New Zealand, Greg. They haven't had a positive test in a thousand days there. There you go. Okay, a thousand days. Now, that's that's New Zealand. We're the United States. Okay, yeah. we're supposed to be the leaders of the world. Yes, not the laughing stock of the world. And that's exactly what we've become. Oh, there's no question. No question. We're a laughing stock right now. And this is gonna people are gonna look back at this twenty, fifty, hundred years from now, and they're just gonna they're gonna shake their heads at this. Um, yeah, for sure. Our Lads Draft Guide, review guide also available here, so you can check that out and order this at ourlads.com. Don't forget the playbook.com magazine is not only available at playbook.com, but also at Barnes & Noble, Books A Million, and uh, other major store outlets nationwide, uh, such as that. So uh, let's get started with the Colts. We'll get started with the favorites. And it, look, it's all Philip Rivers uh, for, for the Colts, but look, they, they have – Put together a very good a uh, front office, coaching staff, and now they have the quarterback. That's what makes this team a very dangerous Super Bowl contender. They've got the trifecta, and they have enough talent on both sides of the ball, along with that trifecta, that this is definitely going to be one of my teams, one of my Super Bowl teams. Twenty to one to super twenty one twenty to one to win the Super Bowl. I'm definitely putting money on them at you know before the season begins. Yeah, they're going to be a player unquestionably inside this division and largely because of Philip Rivers, as you mentioned here, who just happens to have made 224 consecutive starts in a row. That's the second most in National Football League history. So it's not like they've got a beat up, worn down, trodden war horse here. He knows how to prepare himself and get ready for football games. I think the biggest thing hanging over his head is the fact that he's been in the league for 18 years, has never won an MVP award. And he's going to end up probably likely being in the Hall of Fame. So a lot of what he does this year is going to go a long way towards stamping his entry into that Hall of Fame. Yeah, that's uh, that, that. No question. If if this team gets to the playoffs, maybe wins the division title, and can't win a big playoff game, and let's say Philip doesn't have a good game, that's going to be a that. That's also going to. He's he's kind of put himself in a. In, 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 a, in an interesting position, because if he doesn't go to the Colts and he stays with the Chargers a few more years and that's his career, I think a lot of people would say, OK, Philip Rivers had himself a nice Hall of Fame career. Now he goes to the Colts and it's almost like, hey, now you get your wish. Now you can you have one more shot at winning that Super Bowl. But if he goes to the postseason because he hasn't had great postseasons, I think he's had more poor postseasons than good postseasons. So if he has a bad postseason game where it's a lot of people point their fingers at him. I don't know. The Hall of Fame jacket may still be on, but it may be on a little, uh, you know, th- th- he may have to size it a little bit uh, more difficultly. I think I agree with you 100%. Uh, and I think what else might work for him in his favor this year is the fact that throughout that 18 year career, he's dominated this particular division of which he's moved into the AFC South. He's 24 and 8 in 32 games against the division, only losing the money five times. Wow. So he's, wow. he's had his success, uh, uh, his fair share of success against this division, of whom he's going to be playing, obviously, two times a year to each opponent. So, you know, there's six games that he's going to go up against. Last year, he got swept, by the way, did Rivers. He went 0-6 in division games 
I look for a reversal that way this year. Uh, on offense, they've added Jonathan Taylor and Michael Pittman in the second round. So those are two big pickups. Uh, this was a team that just didn't have enough skill position players after the injuries, especially to the receiver position and the tight end position in general. Trey Burton is also back reuniting with Frank Reich. Uh, but also, let's not forget the defense and the tremendous acquisition of DeForest Buckner. Uh, one of the top interior linemen in the NFL. Uh, the Colts have got some really talented players. And now all of a sudden, with Justin Houston, he still has a little bit left in the tank. You've got uh, Toure, who is he's had a share of injury issues dating back to Rutgers. But when he's healthy, he's a comer. So there's a lot more talent there. Darius Leonard has uh, been an, uh, just a fantastic young linebacker for them. I think the big question with the Colts now is going to be in that secondary. Well, it might well be, and you know, whatever they're going to go as far as you mentioned, Greg, as, as far as this defense can lead them, because the offense is practically a given uh, that way this particular football season with the addition of Rivers. And I also happen to feel that Jonathan Taylor is going to end up being the Nick Chubb of his class in this National Football League draft, a second-round running back who I feel is going to dominate in this league here. Uh, he didn't put up all those big, big numbers at Wisconsin by any freakish nature. He's a freakish athlete is what he is. Uh, he's a track star who became a running back, and he's uh, absolutely, I think, a plum of a draft pick. So I think he's going to end up helping this attack that way this year. And my other closing note about the Colts that, this year, one of the reasons I, I can see success for them is we use a formula in the Playbook magazine, the Playbook Preview Guide magazine, in rating teams what I call true strengths of schedule. Okay. And the true, the true strength of schedule is not what their record was against the opponent or what the opponent's records were last year to whom they're playing. It's the projected season win totals in Las Vegas of their opponents this year. And they have by far the softest slate of opponents of all teams in the National Football League do the Colts. Mm. So, you, so you couple that together here. That's going to be another tell, telling tale of why they're favored to win this division. Okay, definitely. Sounds good. Uh, now, let's talk about Tennessee. The Titans, who had that magical run, uh, it, it all happened as soon as Ryan Tannehill entered the lineup. Now the question is, was that one of those fluky type of years where everything worked perfectly? Tannehill was healthy. They had the frustration of Marcus Mariota never getting it done. Tannehill comes in, and all of a sudden the team starts winning. Now, we all know when you go inside the numbers and you watch the game, especially not just Ryan Tannehill, it's, it's Derrick Henry. It's, he's the leader of this offense. And it was amazing the lack of passes that Tannehill needed to attempt for them to still win football games. Uh, and that's why I don't know if this is a team that I'm sold on that can have another type of run like this unless everything kind of falls into place again. Look, I'm a, I'm, I'm a big Mike Vrabel fan. Love what he brings to that organization. Henry was tagged, so he looks like he's going to be there at least in a few years, you would hope, at, at his maximum. Uh, offensively, they should be pretty much the same and maybe even better because it's another year in the system. I don't know. I mean, defensively, they added Christian Fulton in the second round. They've got a couple other young, talented defenders that they've drafted over the last few years that need to take that next step, and that's what I need to see. I need to see some guys stepping up in the front seven. Now that Jarrell Casey's gone, the leader's gone, so now they have to have new, young, fresh faces step up. I don't see that. If I don't see, like, a star, you know, and I'm talking about whether it's Rashawn Evans uh, or a Harold Landry or a Jeffrey Simmons, if one of these guys doesn't break out, to be that number one guy on defense, still not sure Tennessee has what it takes since I don't think Ryan Tannehill is ever going to be a top 10 quarterback to, 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 to get back and for all the pieces to, to, to be put into place once again when there's so much competition in the AFC. Well, I'm of the belief, Greg, that when a team makes an advance much like Tennessee made last year and you can pinpoint the reasons why, then the question you have to ask yourself is, can they do it again this year? Mm -hmm. And can the, those pinpointed reasons stand up again this year? Derrick Henry had a career year last football season here. Maybe he's got more in him, but it was certainly a terrific year last year. 
Ryan Tannehill had arguably his best football season last year. And again, a lot of that was paved by uh, Derrick Henry. Uh, I honestly feel that this team takes a step backward this Mm -hmm. year. Uh, And I'm going to go right to the defense. I see a team that won 11 games last year, and their defense went backwards 35 yards a game. You can't continue to win games with smoke and mirrors with a leaky defense in a division where it's either very, very mediocre or very, very balanced. But the bottom line here is now, suddenly, the coaches in this division are going to have game film on Ryan Tannehill. That The only other game film they ever had on him was with the Miami yep, Dolphins. Yep. But now, suddenly, he's got, they've got his tendencies with the Tennessee Titans here. And I think it's going to end up hurting this football team, and I think they're going to make a big step backwards this season. Yeah, you take a look, and there really wasn't a lot of – there's just not a lot of new faces, impact play, players on this team this year. And 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 I just think that when you look at the AFC, you, you think Buffalo will be better. Matter of fact, even teams at the bottom, and I'm not sure if they're on Tennessee schedule, but even teams that are – that had bad years. I think the Jets will be better. I think the Dolphins will be more competitive. I think that uh, we talked about the North a couple of weeks ago. We built, we, we know Pittsburgh's going to be better with Roethlisberger. Cleveland should be better. Cincinnati should be better. The Colts are going to be more improved with rivers. Uh, you have the West. I think the Raiders are going to continue to improve. Uh, so, and maybe even Denver will be better. So I just think there is so much competition at AFC and there's so many teams that I think have the talent to be better. It's just, it's asking an awful lot for me to think that Tennessee can, can, can do it again with pretty much the same cast of characters. Well, as you say, there are going to be teams in the AFC that are going to step up this year. So Tennessee is going to at least have to play to last year's level to fend them off. Yes. I don't think they're going to be able to do just that. Okay, so if they can't fend them off, uh, what happens? You know, you're, you're going to be on the outside looking in at the playoffs. And I'm going to point out one other thing here. In their schedule this year, they have the mother of all division sandwich games this year. Okay. They're going to they're going to play the Colts on one end. Then they're going to go to Baltimore. Then they're going to come back and play the Colts again. Well, in between when they go to Baltimore, remember last year when they beat Baltimore right. in the playoffs, yep. and they were and they were walloped in the yards, 530 to 300 yards. They lost the yards by 230 yards in the contest here. You better believe Baltimore is going to have this game circled in blood. Yes. So in between the Colts, mark that down. This could be a real bad division letdown sandwich for Tennessee this football season. Yeah, and look, if Ryan Tannehill, even if he plays like he did last year, which, again, it wasn't, it wasn't like a – He's okay. He's, he's a decent quarterback that needs to yes. have the running game. And 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 he's not going to elevate. I, I don't see Ryan Tannehill being any better than what we saw last year. I think that that's what that's the best of Ryan Tannehill. That's it. It's good. And if they've got that running game going, and more importantly, like, you, like we both agreed, if that defense eventually, whether this year or next year, becomes a top 10 defense, okay, maybe they could have that great year and win a Super Bowl. It's possible. But – Look, I, I, they're not going away. They're going to be a competitive team. I could see them winning anywhere between eight and ten games. But you'd mentioned the schedule and all the other teams catching up to them. I just, I'm, I'm probably looking at maybe nine wins, and then they're going to have to hope to somehow find a way to get into the postseason. But uh, unless Philip Rivers gets hurt. Uh, and they catch some breaks, I just don't see them winning the division. And and they still have to deal with Houston, who we're going to get to in just a minute as well. Well, you know, mark this down that in that little three-game trek that I outlined, the Colts, Baltimore, and the Colts, if they end up taking the hat trick in all three of those football games, don't be surprised if you find the fans in the stands yelling, we want Mariota, even though he's not there. (laughs) We want Mariota. Oh, please. They didn't want him. They sent him to town. But the bottom line here is I think it catches up with Ryan Tannehill this season. And this is all Ryan Tannehill now. And remember, he doesn't yes. stay healthy very often. The backup is Logan Woodside. The number three is Cole McDonald. So if something were to happen to Tannehill during the season, they're, 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 I mean, they may not win another game. They're going to be in big trouble. They sound, they sound like two good XFL quarterbacks. Yeah. Woodside and and McDonald, yes. They might exactly. want to pick. Uh, don't be surprised. In other words, if 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 they make a pickup before the season begins, uh, but uh, we'll I would see. I would be surprised at all. Right. Yep. I agree. Okay. Oh, by the way, Vic Beasley was their top pickup, and I'm just come on. I mean, I, I Vic Beasley is is I think his best days are behind him. I, I maybe because of 
Vrabel, he can get his season resurrected, maybe, possible. But I'm, I'm, I'm in, you know, Vic Beasley is like a one year wonder guy to me. Well, I agree with you. You know, he, you know, he had a lot of promise when he came out as a number one pick. I don't think he ever lived up to his ability. And now, with the, you say the better days in the rearview mirror, I don't know why suddenly everything's going to kick in the gear for him as well. So I think he'll end up not helping this defense out and end up being part of the problem. Okay, now here's Houston. And I just think it's kind of funny. Look, I'm not – the odds when you go from even to three to one with the top three teams, that's still – you know what, if I really like Indianapolis, I'm not going to take Houston just because of the odds. So I think they're uh, all things being equal. I think there's no way this is, this is like one of the divisions that you would have to be crazy to put money on one of those three teams. Cause it's so even an injury here, a, a, you know, a, a, a last second win here, you know, a turnover there, a bad call there. And who knows who's going to win the division between those three teams. So if you're really looking to, to make some money on odds, I think you definitely have to go with the championship odds or the Super Bowl odds. But wow, I mean, no respect to Houston when when they're 66 to one and the other two teams are 28 and 20 to one, considering how close they are related in the division. I know this probably has a lot to do with uh, Bill O'Brien. Uh, he gets trashed a lot. I get it. Uh, I, I know he's not the greatest game day head coach, but. If I don't know if you're a Houston guy, and I'm not saying I hear this in Houston because I don't live in Houston, but if you're a Houston fan, before Bill O'Brien came, there wasn't an awful lot of winning there. But Bill O'Brien has been there easily their most successful head coach. They've had their most successful run since he's been there. Now they have Watson, but the problem, but but obviously the problem is, is now he's got total control. And after the offseason that he, we, that he went through, it's a lot of people wondering, you know, is he another Chip Kelly type guy that once he gets all control, he, he doesn't know what he's doing and, he, and he's trading superstar receivers and he's making weird deals. That could happen. But anytime you can show me 16 games of Deshaun Watson with the talent that team has, they're still going to be a tough team to beat in a regular season. Well, as I mentioned in the magazine here, Greg, I think that Bill O'Brien went on hydroxychloric <laughs> when overloaded when he <laughs> in that trade of uh, DeAndre Hopkins for David Johnson. My goodness, I have no idea what he was thinking. I know there was a personality clash there, but you know, you're talking about a first team all pro bowler against a guy who's better days in the rear view mirror and he'll probably be on the injured list more often than he won't be this football season here. I have no idea what his thinking or rationale was behind that, perhaps other than to maybe clear some poison out of the locker room, which is what maybe he thought was going possible. on there. Possible, I think. Possible, you know, I, that maybe and money. You know, part of the, you know, he's gonna he's gonna get yeah. paid a lot of money. Yep. Now, now you couple all of what he did with that, and you come up with a future draft on top of it because of the trades. I mean, yeah. Yes, he was he, he was handcuffed. You know, they've only they only had five picks in the draft. So, and, and, you know, the trade because of the trade. Which might so, actually work out uh, for him okay this year since nobody's able to get their rookies to play a lot. But still, the point is the talent just isn't there now because of his mortgaging his future away and his draft picks. Exactly. And he's, he's another, or O'Brien is, but this team more specifically is another 11-win football team that went backwards 45 yards a game last football season here. You can't keep winning games with smoke and mirrors and expect to keep doing it year after year after year. But look at this team and the, uh, what they did uh, after their bye week last year. They played nine games. They were out yarded six times in those football games. Mm. This from a, from a team that went on to the playoffs last football season here. Again, that catches up with you in the long run. I think there's two football teams that are about to be exposed in this, con or in this division this year, Houston and Tennessee both. And because of that, again, another reason why the Indianapolis Colts find themselves the favorite in this division. Yeah, the, look, O'Brien's his DNA on offense, he's, and, and, and he's got the superstar quarterback. He also, even though he, he trades away the star receiver, he was able to bring in Cooks. Okay, now, again, we could talk about the trade and, and what he got, what he didn't get for, for a bunch of the trades he's made over the last couple of years. But, you know, let's just take a look at the roster. He's got Cobb, Fuller, and Cooks. I can't really count Fuller because he's never healthy. But he's got Cooks and Cobbs. That's okay. That's, that's, that's a good couple of, uh, you know, number one and number two if you go that way. Uh, he's got, we don't know what he has in David Johnson. He might not have anything left in the tank. 
Uh, he could be uh, he could be a complete disaster, or who knows. Uh, but he's got Duke Johnson there. Unfortunately, there's not a lot past that, and I'm kind of surprised. Uh, running backs, there's a ton of running backs in this league, but he's going all in on David Johnson and Duke Johnson. What I do like is the offensive line. They were a disaster for several years, and that's the one part of the entire team that I think that they've done the best work whether it's having Tunsil now on the team, using top draft picks last year on Sharping and Howard. Uh, this is the best-looking offensive line we've seen in Houston maybe ever. Uh, and I, I don't even know if they've ever had a, good, a better offensive line talent-wise in the history of the franchise. So offensively, they should be fine, but it is that defense. You know, the, the defense, it's the same linebackers coming back for like the third straight year. I know on paper it looks like the guys are – pretty good, you know, talented players, but they're not difference makers, you know, besides Watt, they're not, they're, they run a three, four defense and JJ Watt it constantly is the one guy that is just the, whenever he plays is, is the only guy. And he's a defensive lineman in a three, four defense, three, four defense. You're supposed to have your best players on the edge at linebacker. They don't have that. That's the reason that they haven't been able to dominate on defense along with a stud like J.J. Watt. Exactly. And, you know, where is the team? Let me ask you this. Why would Las Vegas, after witnessing an 11-win performance by this football team last year and seeing the team come back pretty much intact, uh, other than the giveaway, you know, obviously the DeAndre Hopkins giveaway, why would they open their season win total at seven and a half? It's because this football team won with smoke and mirrors last year, and they didn't do anything to improve that situation or that condition. Wow. I didn't know so, that. You know, the bottom, seven and yeah. a half. Yes. With seven Deshaun and a Watson, a quarterback. Right, so, wow. you know, there's not, yep. There's not a lot of respect for this Houston football team, and there are reasons why. Yeah, the defense, the secondary, too, is it looks like it's a disaster. I mean, there's a couple of play. I mean, Justin Reed – Bradley Roby had a decent comeback last year. You never know what you're getting out of Gary on Conley. Uh, I mean, they've got Ver Vernon Hargraves. I mean, are you kidding me? You're going to give serious reps to Vernon Hargraves? Come on. Can't if you're going to have success. Can't. Remember, remember, Greg, last year, those 11 wins, nine of them were by a touchdown or less. That was a very, very fortuitous season for this football team here, and they did nothing to, I think, improve their prospects this football season here. I don't have them competing in this division whatsoever. Yeah, and the playoff loss, I mean, you talk about an all-time – I mean, I, I hadn't seen anything like that ever in my life. The way Houston took the lead, had all the momentum, and you could tell as soon as Kansas City – as soon as Houston – and I don't know, I'm not going to complain about them kicking a field goal when they kicked the field goal when they did – they were still up so many points. You're still supposed to stop them. But it, everything turned after that, and the defense just couldn't. It, it, I've just never seen anything like it. They couldn't do anything. They couldn't remotely come close to stopping Kansas City after that. Have you ever seen a playoff game turn like that before? No, and you could see it coming, too. Yes. After, after consecutive scores by Kansas City, it was like, uh-oh. It was like it was over. You know, they were losing by double digits, and you felt the Chiefs had to lead. And, you, and if you had Houston, you had the wrong team in the football game. You just knew it was coming. And so did the players in the field. And unfortunately, again, like you say, there was nothing that they could do about the loss. That, by the way, was a, a really good live bet. Because those are the ones when you know the odds are still in your favor oh. and you know, wait a second, this oh, you know Kansas City is coming back yeah. here. Yeah, there's a lot of people I know in Vegas that made a lot of money in in-game wagering <laughs> <laughs> in that yeah. football game on Kansas City, yes. especially after that first quarter. <laughs> All right, let's wrap right. it up with the Jags, who inexplicably have brought back Doug Maroney for another year. And I, I don't know what that's about. Uh, you know, I mean, because they're not going to do anything this year unless they win more games than you expect them to. And I'm only saying like five or six. Because let's say Houston does come down and maybe Tennessee does come down. Maybe the Jags steal a couple of wins and they say, okay, you know, we've got something going here. We'll keep Doug Marone for another year. 
but I, I don't know what's going on here in Jacksonville. A few years ago, they were a couple of plays away from Super Bowl. And it's been downhill since then. And Gakwe is still holding out. No idea what the heck's going on there. We saw what they did with Ramsey. They, they stole the trade there, but, I, but they're trying to steal another trade. But now they have no power in the trade with Ngakwe. So I think they've kind of screwed that up. Uh, it's about Gardner Minshew at this point to find out whether Gardner Minshew actually can be a starting quarterback. But this is definitely one of the teams that you would have to believe will have will be in the Trevor Lawrence sweepstakes. Now, the big question is if there is absolutely no college football and every conference decides to call it quits, what happens to the season to the kids? And what happened? And I think that's an easier way to figure out. But if the SEC and the Big 12 and the ACC play, then wow. I mean, the draft is going to be really hard to figure out how they're going to do this. How, the kids that couldn't play, how, how, how are they going to wind up staying another year just because they need their draft stock to rise? I mean, but if Trevor Lawrence, as long as he gets an opportunity to play, Mark, he's still going to be the number one pick. He'll be the number one pick even if he doesn't play. Even if he play, doesn't right? play, yeah. <laughs> yes, exactly. You might know, be so. better off for him that he doesn't play. It, it might be. You know, you know, why risk the COVID and, you know, why risk an injury? Yeah. But, you know, you could tell he, he football is in his blood and he really, truly does want to play. Yep. We'd all love to see that have to happen as well. But I'm like you. I wouldn't be at all surprised to see him in a Jags uniform next year. Their season win total, four and a half wins. That tells you where they're expected to finish dead last with the number one pick in the National Football League draft this year. And it wasn't it wasn't at all a surprise when they posted that number. When you look at how they laid down at the end of the season last year in the last eight games, they were out yarded seven times in those football games. They were just a walkover uh, last That's football That's why I don't season. understand Maybe how that, Maroon stayed on as coach. I, I don't get it. Well, you know, you, you hit it on the head. Uh, sometimes when, uh, when out of the clear blue sky, when never was it expected something good happens to a team or a coach, and he suddenly, and it blows my mind, he's inked to an extension because of a one-year uh, result. And that 12-win effort three years ago is what did it for Marone. Yep. He's, he's been nothing but mediocre in his National Football League career. You take that one good year away three years ago, and he's a losing coach. So I'm a little bit perplexed myself as well. And when they do draft Trevor Lawrence, number one pick, you will also see a new coach in the sidelines of Jacksonville. Yeah, you would definitely have to believe that. That's for sure. The thing, uh, look, I, I might actually go over the four. I don't think Jacksonville is is where Miami was talent-wise because at least Minshew had an opportunity to play. They have Leonard Fournette. There's still some talent at receiver. I'm a big uh, LaVisca Chennault fan. I even like Colin Johnson. DJ Shark is 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 a is a is an up and coming uh, star at wide receiver, so I, I think offensively, you know, they should be better. And defensively, I mean, I don't know if Ngakwe plays, that's good. You know, they drafted Chase on in the first round. They drafted Henderson in the first round. And again, we don't think Tennessee and Houston is going to be as good. I could see Jacksonville winning five or six games. I really can if it all goes well, as long as Minshew plays better and doesn't like implode and become some sort of disaster, or he gets injured and Mike Glennon has to play the rest of the year. Well, I think that the number that it gets bandied about in Jacksonville these days at the end of this football season will be one for 13. And what that is is one winning season the last 13 years for the Jacksonville Jaguars. <laughs> which means there's changes are coming yeah. and I believe they're going to happen yeah. this year. <laughs> yeah. I'm not going to put, I wouldn't put any money on them getting to five wins, but if I had to choose five or four, I think I might go with five, but uh, I don't know. We'll see. I, and then look, they got to get off to a good start too. And, and they have to take advantage of maybe their schedule. I don't even know if they can, but they have to take advantage of, of, of the fact that there's so much uncertainty early on in the season, which should help the underdogs, you would think. I mean, that's the way – it's kind of the way I'm thinking about when, when, when I'm going into – and we'll talk more about the strategy of how we're going to deal with this, obviously, turning to your expertise. But uh, I'm thinking underdogs may not be a bad way to go earlier in the season than the favorites because of potential uncertainty. I agree with you 100% on that logic. And when you mentioned about Jacksonville has to get off to a good start, that's going to be really, really difficult just given the fact – that they were dead last in the National Football League in points allowed in the first quarter of their games last year. 
they were dead, done, and buried after the first quarter of football games last year. So that has got to turn around for this team as well. All right, Mark. So uh, playbook.com, uh, how's that coming along? I know you got the coffee cup every morning. I get that emailed uh, to me. So talk a little bit about that. And uh, also playbook.com for any fans that still, for some reason, have not ordered the, 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 the magazine yet. Yeah, what's really nice, the magazine, first of all, is going to be in your hands all football season long, and it may be an extended football season this year, Greg, if college football comes back in the spring, especially so, so it will end up being a long-term magazine. <laughs> and in fact, our regulars who have it oftentimes order two because they wear it out uh, because they're going through it each and every week. So we're going to expect people to come back and order extra copies because of an extended season here that way this year. You can get the magazine at playbook.com. Or, as you mentioned earlier on in the show, at the Barnes & Nobles or Books A Million stores. Yeah, wouldn't that be interesting? That's the other equation into the mess is what if the SEC and ACC and Big 12 say we're playing? Well, what happens to the Big 10, Pac-12, and all the other conferences that have said we're, 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 we're thinking of coming back in the spring? So do they now come back in the spring and they try and play their football in the spring? And how does that – what do they do with the draft that they play in the spring? I mean, it's just crazy. I, I honestly think there is a less than 10% chance that there's going to be any spring football. I think it's canceled. Well, it's right. done because I've, I've heard this story before. Oh, yeah, everything will be, be okay in a few months. Oh, everything will be okay. And then, and, then, and then every time we get to that next week and that next month, they keep pushing the ball down the field – Oh, uh, let's go. Let's wait a little bit longer. Uh, let's suspend the season. We'll be back in the spring. And then we'll get to the spring. Uh, let's just call it quits and wait till 2021. Let's play what if here, Greg. Okay. What if the SEC, the ACC, and the Big 12 do have their way and they do play football? And here we are now in November and things are going along merrily. There's no, nobody's uh, coming down with the virus. The players are all in great protocols. Do you think that the Big Ten and the Pac-12 might not reverse their course and say, heck, with spring, Let's we're going to get ready here. Let's play now. Let's play December. Let's play January. Well, don't you think so, that isn't, – isn't that the reason that it's strange that they announced it the way they did? I thought as of yesterday that they were going to say we are going to postpone the season and we'll figure this out in a couple of months or we'll go month to month. Why say we're canceling the season and everything until January? Why say it like that? I, I think they feel they're doing the right thing uh, as far as being an institution goes and not playing the game for the love of the money and the money alone. Uh, I think that's their moral obligation to do just something like that. But again, I'm going to go back to what if, you know, okay. what if things are going well, you know, and if what if will they make that will they make that U-turn and make that decision? That remains to be seen. But I do know this, that because of all this, as we opened up at the beginning of the show and talked about, I think this opens the door for a big season for the National Football League, yep. provided they can get their act together and not be like Major League Baseball. Uh, and I think they're going to end up having to bubble up the National Football League will before the season gets gets underway. I know it's going to be a big, big change, but I think they're going to end up having to do just that. And let's not forget, too, there's an election in November, and I don't know what happens either way, but that also could somehow, especially if, like you said, if the numbers are down and we're past an election, all of a sudden are politics taken out of the way, and does that enter into the equation as well, no matter who wins? And that's possible. It's another part of the equation that... Could be interesting come November, as long as, as you say, the numbers go down and everything looks like it's better. Well, it's all part of this, what seems to be or appears like a never ending novel. And, uh, you know, where there doesn't look like there's an end in sight to anything or an answer in sight to anything. So as we speak and we'll talk again next week when we get back together here. I'm sure the situation will have changed <laughs> yeah. to some degree, some way, some point. Probably. <laughs> and That'll be the talking point next week. Next week, it's the NFC West. We have two more of these shows. And then the week before the season begins, we'll have our season preview show. So we'll have a lot to talk about there. Our predictions. Uh, we'll have our futures predictions, Super Bowl, all that kind of stuff. So, And obviously, taking a look at week one in the NFL without any 
any anything with with no preseason, with, with no hardly any film from camp. So it should be quite interesting, and we'll talk about uh, so many variables and how you're 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 going to handicap the season uh, in a few weeks. I'm looking forward to that conversation, Mark. Well, I am too, Greg, and I'll share with you next week on the show about the NFC. There is a dynamite situation that is going to happen in the National Football League with the team outside out of the NFC West. I'll tell you what that situation is and who the team is next week. Mark, appreciate it. Talk to you then. Have a great week, Greg. Be good. Stay safe.